Thank you for joining us again for another study from the Word of God. I'm going to be looking at a sermon entitled, Burdens Become Blessings. This is actually the second part of the sermon. The first part is uploaded on our channel. We encourage you to look for that and to listen to the first part of this sermon. But in this part, we're going to begin in the book of Luke. We're going to start in uh, over in Luke chapter 2 and talk about the woman named, named Anna. Before we do that, we want to begin our service with a word of prayer, and then we'll do a brief review of our first lesson and the first part of this sermon, and then we'll get into our text. Let's all bow for a word of prayer. Our most kind and gracious, holy and righteous Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for this day of life, for the many blessings of it, for all the good things that you do for us and that you provide for us, for our food and clothing and shelter. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to set aside this time to open thy word and to read and study from it, to learn thy truth and to learn things that will strengthen our faith, things that will motivate us to live the Christian life and to set an example before others, things that will help us to live in a way that is pleasing unto thee and will bring honor and glory to thy name. We pray that you'll bless us as we study, that we'll have hearts that are open to thy truth, and that as we open thy word, we'll take the things that we learn and apply them and live them out in our daily lives. We're so thankful for thy son Jesus and for his willingness to leave heaven and come to this world, to live among men, to live as one of us, and then to be willing to lay down his life upon the cross, to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. We're thankful for his blood. We're thankful for the power that it has to forgive our sins. We're thankful for his resurrection and for his ascension, for the establishing of his kingdom and for the privilege that we can have of being members of it. We pray that as we look into your word and as it goes forth, that we'll see those things that are true, find things that will help us to remember all the good that you've done for us, to remember the hope that we have through thy son and the, the promise of eternal life in heaven, and let that motivate us to live our lives in submission to thy will and giving them sacrificially to serve thee each day that we have here on this side of eternity. Forgive us for our sins. We know that we're weak and sinful. We pray for strength to overcome our temptations to do better in the future. We pray thy blessings upon the sick throughout our land. Those that we are thinking of now, especially due to the virus in our land, we pray that they may be healed. Pray you bless those who are caring for them. Bless us all with protection. Help us to get through this trying time that things may be better for us in the near future. Watch over our country. Bless our leaders that they'll make decisions that are good what is best for the people of this land and also for the truth of thy gospel to go forth into all the world. Bless us as we study. Help us always to seek to know thy will and to live faithful unto death so we can have that eternal home with thee in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in our study, our, our last study in connection with this lesson, we introduced the idea by talking about how the Bible uses the figure of childbirth to illustrate an important principle that things that we sometimes see as burdens, things that might be painful, things that might cause us trouble or even heartache, how oftentimes those result in great blessings. So there's pain involved in, in labor, travail, the Bible calls it, when a woman is going to have a child. But then there's tremendous joy when the child is born, and the pain is soon forgotten. The joy overtakes the pain. And that principle is something that we see throughout scriptures, and we looked at three ways in our, in our last lesson that demonstrate this principle of burdens becoming blessings. And so we talked about the burden of labor, and it's just a physical example that, again, illustrates the principle. We looked at the story of Noah. And how God gave him a tremendous challenge, a tremendous burden to build an ark. Something that had never been done before, had never been needed before. Yet Noah took upon himself that labor. He bore that burden and the ark was completed. And the result was tremendous blessing. His family was saved from the flood that destroyed the entire world. So the burden led to blessing. We also talked about the burden of distinctiveness, and we looked at excuse me, the example of Timothy and how Timothy had a mother 
who was Jewish, and a father who was a Gentile, and how that caused problems in the society that he lived in. There was much prejudice and animosity and even hatred between the two groups, and how that could have been used as an excuse not to do anything, to say no one will listen. Yet Timothy didn't act that way. He didn't respond that way. Instead, what God did and what Paul did was to see the blessing that could come from Timothy's burden. And so God had the gospel. It was preached. It was proclaimed. And when Timothy believed it and obeyed it, God saved him from his sins, just as he does all of us. And now Timothy is presented with opportunities to serve the Lord. Paul met Timothy and saw the potential in him and took him with him on missionary trips. And so he didn't let the, the distinctiveness of, of Timothy a burden. He, he didn't allow that to rob him of the view of the blessing. And Timothy himself chose to use his burden to do good. He preached the gospel both to Jews and to Gentiles. Congregations that Paul would establish in lands where there was a Jewish population and a Gentile population, they would become mixed congregations, and Timothy was able to preach to both. Those who were Christians and also those who had never become Christians because of his distinctive background. And we learn from that that distinctiveness may sometimes be a burden to us, but we can always bring a blessing out of it. God can use those things to enable us opportunities to teach others. Some that another might not reach, I might be the person to reach them because of the burdens in my life, the, the trials and tests that I have gone through. Maybe I can reach someone in a similar situation. And that's true for all of us, just as it was for Timothy. And then thirdly, we talked about the burden of sickness. And we looked at the example of from John 9 of the man who was blind from birth and how Jesus came and healed that man of his blindness. And in, in the story, the question was asked, you know, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said it wasn't because of anyone's sins, but this was something, even though it, it had, had come upon this man not because of sin, it was something that God could use to bring glory to himself and to his son, Jesus. So Jesus healed this man of his blindness and it became evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God. And so his sickness, while it was a burden for him and something to be born, ultimately brought about tremendous blessing in his own life and in the lives of others. So that's the principle that we're looking at in this study. And tonight, as I mentioned, we're going to start in Luke chapter 2. We want to talk about the example of Anna and talk about the burden of grief, the burden of grief. Now, as we as we get into this and we talk about grief, uh, I want to make sure that we understand that in no way are we trying to minimize grief or trying to, to teach in a way that makes anyone, you know, their, their grief affects every person differently. And sometimes we talk about stages of grief and, and all of those things, and everyone goes through them differently. Some affect others in different ways, you know, then they affect different people. And, and we all experience those things differently. And it's just a process that we go through as human beings, and it's something that happens. And wherever we may be in a journey of grief, I, I don't want anything that we say to seem like we're trying to minimize that because it's, it's something we all have to go through. But there are some lessons that can be learned from grief and from grieving that that tremendous burden, in many ways, perhaps the greatest burden we're, we'll ever have to bear in this life that God can bring great blessings out of it. And I want us to think about that. I think it's important to think about that as we study God's word. So in Luke chapter two, we have the story of a woman named Anna. The Bible says about her in verse 36, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. 
And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So here we have this woman named Anna. And we're told about her that she was married for seven years. She, she lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. So this was her first marriage. They were married for seven years, and then her husband died. And she lived as a widow for the rest of her life. And the Bible says she was about 84 years old. So however old she was when she was married, whatever her age was as a young woman, now she's 84. And only seven of those years were lived with her husband. He passed away and she continued as a widow for the rest of that time. That's a, a tremendous burden to be born. The burden of the grief of losing a spouse, the grief of being left alone in, in a sense that your spouse has, has, has died, and the grief of having all of those years of widowhood, how young she must have been when she was first married. But now she's been a widow for all of these years. What can we learn from this, from that tremendous burden? Well, we learn that blessings can come from it. You think about Anna, and even though she'd experienced this tremendous grief, she didn't allow it to separate her from God. Notice again what is said in this passage. First of all, she was a prophetess, meaning that she taught people the will of God. She's uh, described as being of great age. Verse 37 tells us about how long she'd been a widow, but it says that she departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. So even though she had grief and even though maybe she had things that had happened in her life that could have caused her to doubt God or caused her to have been angry at God or caused her to have lost her faith, whatever, you know, sometimes, you know, those thoughts go through our minds as we're suffering with grief. She didn't allow that to happen. She never abandoned her God. In fact, she devoted herself more completely to him. She remained at the temple constantly. She served God night and day by fasting and praying. Now, maybe she wasn't a woman who could do certain things in service to God, but she could pray. And we often say, you know, that that's the least you can do. The truth is that's the best you can do to pray, to, to go before the throne of grace and mercy of our Father in heaven and to implore his aid and, and his providence being involved in the lives of others. What greater thing could be done? But that's what she did. And she not just prayed, not only prayed, but she did so with fasting which shows us how dedicated she was to it. She robbed herself of physical blessings in order to focus on spiritual things. And she remained at the temple. Think of all the help that she was to those who came there, learning of them, praying about them, even with fasting. This was a woman whose tremendous grief drove her closer to God instead of further away from him. And so we learn that grief can be a source of tremendous blessings in our life. And there are some reasons why. Number one, because grief reminds us of our dependence upon God. Poor Hannah, when she lost her husband, the man that she'd been dependent upon in her life, learned that she still had one she could trust, one she could believe in, one who would take care of her and provide for her. And that was God. She learned her dependence upon God. And how many times when we lose a loved one, someone who is very close to us, are we reminded how much we need God? There's a kind of pain and anguish of spirit sometimes that no one else is able to take away. No one else is able to help us through. Only God. What a wonderful privilege we have as Christians that we can pray. And as Peter wrote, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you, to know that we can take all of our care, all of our concerns, all of our grief, and turn it over to God, and he'll take care of it for us. 
He'll see us through the journey. The 23rd Psalm reminds us, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So we go through that valley sometimes. And it's a valley, and it's shaded, and, and this shadow, it seems like the light is gone. But God never leaves us. If we stay with Him, He'll stay with us. And He'll give us strength and comfort and see us through. Because He's a God who loves us. And grief reminds us of how dependent upon Him we truly are. Grief also encourages us to long for heaven. It encourages us to long for heaven. When a loved one leaves us in this world, yet we know that they're a faithful child of God, we know where they're going. God is true to His Word and His promises are sure. And those whose sins are washed away by the blood of Christ are promised eternal life in heaven. And when I know that my loved ones are there, it makes me want to be there too. Obviously, I want to go because that's where God is. That's where my Father is. That's where the Savior is. That's where the Holy Spirit is. And I want to dwell with God for all eternity in His presence and in His protection and care and love. But when I also know that friends and loved ones, parents, grandparents, children, those who have gone on, and we know where they've gone, that they're there also, it makes me long for heaven. That motivates me to live a life that is pleasing to God. A life that encourages me that I'm going to make it to heaven and also that I want others to go there too. And so not, not only do I live in obedience to the gospel, but I teach others the word of God. And that's something that comes from grief. It makes us long for heaven. But it also, enduring grief going through the struggle of grief and the ups and downs of it, the Bible teaches us that it enables us to be able to help others also. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 3. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So when we're comforted by God, we learn how to comfort others. You see, when we go through the trial of grief and, and we're able to overcome the darkness and the things that, that get in our way and oppose us with God's help, we're then able to help someone else see that God can help. And again, we all go through it in our own ways and, and we don't force, you know, there's not one set thing that you enforce upon another, but it's a reminder that God is faithful and true and he helped me. And so now I want to help you and I can share my experience and of course, share God's word and his truth. And by doing so, grief enables others enables those who have gone through it to comfort others. And that's a tremendous blessing to be able to help others in the in the in that kind of way. So when we think about the burden of grief, what a terrible burden it is to be born. It, it's horrible. Death, death is terrible. Consequence of sin. It's why Jesus came into the world to remove sin so we could be freed from this horrible burden of death. But... Going through that burden and that suffering and losing loved ones, it can bring tremendous blessings. It shows us our dependence upon God and makes us remember just how much we need Him and at the same time how much we love Him, how good He is to us. It makes us long for heaven and it helps us to be able to help others. So grief is a burden. But let's remember that burdens can become blessings when we see them from God's perspective, and we respond to them in harmony with His will. Secondly, let's talk about another burden that becomes a blessing, and that is the burden of preaching. And I just want to, to talk about this briefly and mention it briefly, but I think it's important to, to, to talk about that preaching is described in the Bible as a burden. 
It's that way a lot in the Old Testament when the prophets would write. Sometimes their prophecies were called burdens, the burden of the Lord, the burden of the word of the Lord. Preaching can be a burden. But I want to read from Isaiah chapter 6, starting down, uh, we'll start, let's see, uh, down around verse number 8. And this, of course, is when Isaiah is called by the Lord to begin his work as a prophet. And so he sees that vision uh, of God and, and so forth. But this is what verse 8 says. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And God said, this is what God says to Isaiah. Now notice, God says, Who can I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah volunteered. He said, I'll go. Here am I. Send me. And this is God's response in verse 9. He said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return and shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Now let's think about what God says to Isaiah. He says, I need someone to go and preach. And Isaiah says, I'll go. And God says, okay, go and preach. And here's what you do when you preach. You tell people my word, but make their heart fat, covered over so the word doesn't get in. You tell them to see, but not understand, not perceive, to hear, but not comprehend. You do these things, you preach my word, knowing that the people to whom you are preaching will not listen. They're not going to accept what you say. They're not going to accept the truth of my word. It's like preaching to a brick wall. You're not going to have converts. And Isaiah says, okay, well, how long? And God says, you preach till the land is desolate. So the story of Isaiah is that the northern kingdom of Israel is going into captivity. And God tells Isaiah, you preach and you tell them what's going to happen and you keep preaching until it happens. So destruction is coming. I'm going to tell you about that destruction, tell you why you're being destroyed, tell you about your sins and how you need to repent of your sins. And you're not going to listen. You're going to keep going your merry way until the nation is destroyed. What a challenge. What a burden of preaching. Imagine being told to go and preach and nobody's going to listen to you. Nobody's going to believe what you say. The people are going to keep sinning and keep doing everything that is wrong until they are destroyed. But you go and preach anyway. Well, you know, that is kind of what we're told in the gospel, right? It's a challenge to preach. The majority don't accept the truth of God's word. There's a broad way and there's a narrow way. And Jesus said, many there be that go down the broad way, but few that walk the straight and narrow, but preach anyway. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Go to the whole world. How many accept that message? It's a burden sometimes. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go and preach, but how many are really going to listen and accept it? Well, Isaiah was told to go and to preach, to be a spokesman for Jehovah, yet he was going to have to bear a tremendous burden. The nation would reject him. 
How discouraging that must have been. But Isaiah was a man of true faith and true devotion. He took God's word seriously and he did what God commanded him to do. And ultimately a blessing came from his work. That last verse that we read, the last verse of chapter six says that there was a remnant. God talks about a tenth. It means it's not the majority of the people, but there will be a faithful few who will hear and who will obey and who will be saved and be spared. So that's the blessing. And all Christians have to bear the burden of preaching. When we talk about preaching the gospel, we're not just talking about the, the person who stands in the pulpit. It's not just the person who stands before a Bible class, but we all, that great commission, go ye, that means go me and you and all of us. We have the burden of preaching, of taking this message to a world, the majority of which doesn't want to hear it and they'll, they will not accept it. They will hear, but they close their ears to it. They might see it, but they close their eyes. They harden their hearts because they want to do things their way. They want to live their life. They want to engage in things that God says are wrong. They want to believe what they want to believe, yet we still must go and preach. And as we go and preach, we have to warn them about the direction they're headed, about what's at the end of this journey, the destruction that is coming from God. He'll punish those who are against him. So it's a burden to go into all the world. It's a burden to have to raise money to go into other places to preach. It's a burden to have doors slammed in your face, to face rejection and to face ridicule. It's a burden to study the Bible. It's a burden to have to diligently study the scriptures because someone has come up with some crazy idea and doctrine that, that doesn't you know make any sense, but you know when you go and talk to this person, you're going to have to defend the truth against their error. And so you have to understand what they say and you have to study it. That's not always easy. There's so many false doctrines in the world that we have to you know study about and know about. That's, that can be a burden. But the blessings of those efforts are eternal. When we do what God says and we preach his word without adding to it or taking from it or altering it in any way, the blessing is that souls are saved. That's eternal blessing. They, they are saved forever. So there's a burden, but it becomes a blessing. So we have the burden of grief. We've talked about the burden of preaching. Let's close by talking about the burden of sacrifice. And this really kind of sums up the, the whole thing that we've been talking about in both of these lessons. Burdens becoming blessings. Burdens are burdens because we have to sacrifice. I want us to go to Philippians chapter 2 and look at the example of Jesus and let this teach us the, the ultimate lesson and, and the concluding lesson of this sermon, of these two sermons about the burden of sacrifice. Philippians 2 and verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so we are told that we have to learn to have the mindset of Christ, to think the way that he thought. Let this mind be in you, which was also in him. So Jesus' mindset was one of serv serving God, doing his will, no matter the cost no matter the sacrifice, no matter what he had to give up. He was willing to serve God, no matter the sacrifice. Now, it's not easy to sacrifice the things that we hold dear. It's not, if it were easy, it wouldn't be a sacrifice, right? So it's not easy. There's, there's a burden that comes with it. Yet, if we're going to follow Christ, follow the example that he set, we have to be willing to make those sacrifices, so let's talk about the sacrifice of Jesus. Verse 6 says, Who, Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So Christ humbly gave up his equality with God in order to leave heaven and come to this world and live as a human being. Now that doesn't mean he ceased being God. He still was and is God always is and always will be. He's eternal by his nature. But it means he left that position in heaven, that place at the side of God, and he came down into this world to be born as a human being. That is a humbling thing. 
and a humiliating thing for God to be a man, to take upon him the form of a human being. Yet Christ made that sacrifice because he loved us. He left the glories of heaven. He, he, he left heaven. We, I try to think about how to explain it. You can't, we can't even imagine. We've never seen heaven. But from everything we know from Scripture, how wonderful and glorious and amazing it must be. So much so that when we get there, we don't ever want to leave. We don't want to think about leaving heaven. Yet Christ did in order to be one of us so he could die on the cross for our sins. He left the glories of heaven. Verse 7 says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He sacrificed having servants, an innumerable host of angels that were his servants, to become a servant. What a sacrifice he made. Look also in verse 7. It says, being found in fashion as a man. I'm sorry, he made himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. He gave up his heavenly body for a physical one. How much trouble do our physical bodies give us with aging and with sickness and with injuries and being hurt and wounded and all those things? He had a spiritual heavenly body and he took upon him human flesh. And then verse 8 says, being found in fashion as a man, in a human body, he humbled himself even further than what he'd done previously. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. So this human body that he took upon him, he allowed it to be put to death. He suffered the agony of death and not just any death, even the death of the cross, the excruciating pain of scourging followed by crucifixion, the nails through his hands and his feet, the sheer agony of attempting to lift oneself just to be able to breathe on the cross. That's what Jesus did. He humbled himself to leave heaven, to be made as a man, not just any man, but a servant, not just any servant, but one who would suffer death and not just any death, the death of the cross. That's sacrifice. And that's what Jesus did for you and for me. He sacrificed his life at Calvary. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He gave his life. He shed his blood, offered it as a sacrifice for our sins. He made that sacrifice. But that burden became a blessing. For him, because he was highly exalted. For him, because he rose from the grave and he ascended back to the Father in heaven. For him, because ascending back to the Father at his right hand, he seated on the throne of David and reigns over his kingdom as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's been given a name that is above every name. There's no other being in existence who has been and is what Jesus is. God and man together. He's the only one. And his name is above every name because of that. And because of that, every knee on earth should bow before him. Every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For it was God's plan that brought all of this into motion. See, the burden became a blessing. But oh, we must not make the mistake of thinking that the blessing was just for him. No, the burden that he bore became our greatest blessing salvation. That's redemption from sin. He paid the price that we could not pay. The price that would enable our sins to be removed. To be redeemed is to be bought back. A person who's been sold into slavery, but you pay the price to purchase their freedom and buy them back into fellowship. That's what Jesus did for us. Salvation is 
redemption, reconciliation, enemies with God are now made friends again. There's friendship between us and God because of the sacrifice, the burden that Jesus bore on our behalf. There's adoption. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, you and I can be adopted into the family of God, be his children, his sons and daughters. He accepts us as one of his own, makes us a member of his family and gives us an inheritance that you would give to children. We're part of his family. And by the way, that family is the church. That's what Jesus purchased with his blood, according to Acts 20, 28. And then there's mediation. Jesus, by bearing the burden he did at the cross, became our mediator, our great high priest. He stands between us and God. And because of that, we can pray to our Father in heaven through him and know that God will hear and answer our prayers. Because of what he did, because he's our great high priest, when the devil accuses us, Jesus is there as our advocate to plead our case. And to say, whatever the devil says we have done that's wrong and sinful, Jesus says, no, that sin's been washed away by my blood. I paid that price for them. So there's no sin laid to their charge, to their account. He's our mediator. All because he bore that burden of sacrifice. Aren't we thankful for such a Savior as Jesus the Christ? Aren't we thankful that he loved us enough to humble himself, to do what he did, to become a man, to be a servant, to be betrayed by his own creation, to have the very beings that he brought into existence with, with the power of his word, to have them spit in his face, to mock and ridicule him, to blindfold him and to hit him, and then to ridicule by saying prophesy who it is that hit you to make a crown of thorns to place on his head and then to hit him with a reed to scourge him to nail him to that old rugged cross he humbled himself to bear that burden for us never committed a sin never did anything wrong only told people the truth the way of salvation yet he suffered terribly bore the burden of sacrifice for our blessings. He's exalted now, and we must exalt him in our lives by submitting ourselves wholly and completely to his will. But there's something else that we have to learn from his example, and that is that you and I must also be willing to bear the burden of sacrifice. We need to be willing to sacrifice because we know the blessings that will come. So we bear the burden of sacrifice in submission to the word of God. You know, when we do that, sometimes it makes enemies. Sometimes it makes people who were our friends not be our friends anymore. Sometimes when we submit to the word of God, it means we have to give up things that, that we enjoy, things that, that we might like. Sinful things, obviously, but sometimes even things that are not sinful in and of themselves. First Corinthians deals with that. Submitting to the word of God means doing what he says, even when it offends others. Even when it causes others not to want anything to do with us. Sometimes it's a burden, but we know the blessing that, that, that comes. To go into all the world and preach the gospel is a burden. But we do it because of the blessings that will come, not just for us, but for others as well. We sacrifice to do that, but it's because burdens become blessings. Sometimes I hear people pray that we will wear out our bodies in service to the Lord. And, you know, that's a sacrifice that we're called to make, to give our lives to serving him. And that is to be faithful unto death. We always have the obligation of doing the will of God, being obedient to him, blood, sweat, and tears for the kingdom. That's who we are as Christians. Is it always easy? Of course not. Are there challenges? Absolutely. Do things get difficult sometimes? Of course they do. But we bear that burden anyway. We're willing to sacrifice because of the blessings that will come. What about our pocketbook. What about our wallet? 
that money that's in the bank that we really want to have to buy this and to buy that and to spend on these things for us. It's a sacrifice to use that money to do the work of the Lord, to support the Lord's church, to support those who preach the gospel, to support those who are doing good, benevolence. It's a sacrifice. It's a burden. But there are tremendous blessings that come from it. And so I hope that as we think about this and think about these, these points that we've talked about in this lesson, that we'll understand that there are burdens and God knows that there are burdens. He understands the world that we live in and the things that we face. But he has designed it in such a way that burdens can always bring blessings. We just have to learn to see them from the right perspective, to respond to them in harmony with the will of God and trust him to see us through. Burdens will come. They'll come into your life. They'll come into mine. And whether it's the burden of sickness or the burden of grief, the burden of being distinctive from others, the burden of physical labor and spiritual labor in the Lord's kingdom, the burden of preaching the gospel or the burden of sacrifice. Whatever burden comes upon us, let's never forget the blessings that will follow. And because we know that God is faithful and true, let's bear up under those burdens. Let's help each other bear one another's burdens. And let's work together to do God's will, to serve Him, and know that the blessings will be tremendous in this life, but even greater in eternity. That's the beauty and that's the hope and the power of the gospel of Christ, that burdens become blessings. I hope we'll think about our own lives individually as we come to the close of this study, and that we'll make sure that we're dealing with our burdens in the right way. But if the burden is the burden of sin, there are blessings on the other side of it, but you have to come through the burden. And the way to do that when it comes to sin, the only way is to have those sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. That comes by hearing God's word, Romans 10, 17, believing the truth of it, that Jesus is his son and our savior. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. We have to believe it. We have to believe it strongly enough that we'll do whatever he asks of us. So repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3, Acts 17, 30. We have to be willing to confess our faith in him as Lord and savior just like the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8. And then we must be baptized for the remission of sins, because that's what the Lord commands us to do. Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, and other passages as well. Upon doing those things, we contact the blood of Christ. Our sins are washed away. That burden then becomes a blessing, because now we can learn from our mistakes, learn from our past, and move forward, putting those things behind us, determining never to go back to that former way of life and give ourselves to wholly and completely serve our Lord, faithful unto death, and knowing that heaven will be our home. I hope we'll think about those things, and I hope if you haven't done those things and you're ready to, that, that you'll make that decision. If you have done those things and become a Christian, but you haven't been faithful to the Lord, and now you're again under that burden of sin, remember that Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That burden of sin can be replaced with the burden of Christ, which is forgiveness and peace that passes understanding, joy beyond comprehension, and eternal life in heaven. Repent of your sins. Confess that you've done wrong. Pray for forgiveness. God will forgive and he will restore. And that burden can again become a blessing. We can give our lives to serve him faithfully. I hope we'll think seriously about those things. Make sure our burdens always become blessings by approaching them from God's perspective and living in obedience to his will. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our most holy and righteous Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this day, for this time that we've had to study together from thy word. We're thankful for its teaching for the encouragement that it gives us. Help us to bear our burdens. Help us to have strength to face not only the temptations that we, that we come across in this life, but also the tests and the trials, the general hardship that we all go through. Help us to have strength 
to put our trust in thee, to lean upon thee, to cast our cares upon thee, to trust in the power of thy word. And so we live in obedience to it, even when it seems like that, like everything is telling us to do differently, that we'll trust your word and do what you say and know that the blessings will come. Bless us, bless our efforts in studying. May it strengthen our faith, motivate us to serve thee faithfully. Watch over us and keep us safe in thy care, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for studying with us. I hope it's been encouraging to you. And I hope that you'll come back again in the future. Thank you.